NASA's Kepler Space Telescope has discovered three exoplanets that might be able to support life. And one of them might be the most Earth-like world spotted to date. So here to give us more on these alien worlds via Skype is Phil Plate, an astronomer and the man behind the Slate blog, The Bad Astronomy. And he's joining us from Colorado. Hi, Phil. Great to see you again. Hi, Alana. Thanks for having me on again. So um, Earth-like planets discovered. How big of a deal is this? Well, it's pretty cool. Now, you know, I want to start this right away and say these aren't other Earths. These are different planets. We don't know that much about them except how big they are, literally their size. And they're all bigger than the Earth, but what's cool about them is that they're not a lot bigger. You know, Jupiter is 11 times wider than the Earth, so it's a big gas giant planet. These planets are only about 1.6, 1.4, and 1.7 times the size of the Earth. So they're in our class of planet. And as far as we know, planets that size are probably going to be Earth-like. They're going to be solid without really thick atmospheres and that sort of thing. But, you know, I feel like this kind of stuff happens kind of often too, right? I mean, we always love these headlines when it says that there's an Earth-like planet out there and we get very excited. What in particular is telling us, uh, you know, about these planets and the one that they say is the most Earth-like to date? Uh, you know, what in particular are they hitting on here? Well, they're talking about two things. They're talking about the size of the planet, that it is roughly the same size as Earth, which is close enough, you know, 1.5, 1.6. And they're also at the right distance from their star that the temperature of the planet isn't too hot and it isn't too cold. There's a region near the star called the habitable zone. And if you're closer than that, you're too hot. And if you're farther than that, you're too cold. These, these three planets that they found are roughly the same size as the Earth and they're the right distance from their star to be warm, not too hot, not too cold. That's called the habitable zone and it has to do with the size and the temperature of the star. Now in these cases, these planets are near the edge but still inside that, that area from their star so that we think that the temperatures can be good enough to have liquid water. And that depends on a lot of stuff. You know, Venus is technically in the sun's habitable zone, but it has such a thick atmosphere that it's super hot. That could be true for these planets. Maybe they're too cold. We don't know. We don't know what kind of atmosphere they have. But when you list all the conditions that you need to have a planet that could possibly be habitable, these planets do better than any that we found previously. And so, you know, we're talking about the Kepler uh, system, too. How far away is this from Earth? Well, there are two different uh, systems we're talking about. One of them is called Kepler-62, and they're named after Kepler, the spacecraft that's discovered them. I and mean, it's looking at 150,000 stars, and they list the candidate stars in order. So one of them is Kepler-62, which is about 1,200 light years from the Earth, so a long, long way. The other one is Kepler-69, which I believe is 2,700 light years away, so it's even farther. So we're not talking about something you're about to, uh, you know, uh, hitch a ride on the Enterprise and go there tonight. Uh, but the fact of the matter is the galaxy is huge. To find planets that are this close to being Earth-like, this close to us, implies that there are lots of these things out there, which is something we've been suspecting now for quite some time. Well, I'd say that that is, uh, that that is pretty exciting, too. Now, so they're also saying they don't know exactly what the, the exoplanets look like here, but a separate study suggested they're probably water worlds covered by endless, uninterrupted global oceans. So even if, you know, we were to say that perhaps they might be a bit of life because they had liquid on them, what kind of life might you imagine might be there? I mean, obviously, <laughs> there's still, still a lot of unknowns. No, that's a good question. Um, I'm hoping Vulcans, uh, if I can make a second <laughs> Star Trek reference. Uh, now, I do want to be careful here. The, the, the idea that these are water worlds has to do with computer models that, have, that deal with uh, uh, what we think the planets are made of and what the stars are like and all these different things. So that is... It's better than speculation, but it's less than knowledge. We don't know that these things have water on them. We're, we just think they do. So, you know, if you had a water world, what kind of life would evolve there? Well, it, it might look a lot like uh, like Earth, because for a long time, for, for most of the Earth's history, life was underwater. And it was only relatively recently uh, that, that life crawled up onto land. So you might see something like that. Fish cephalopods, that sort of thing. But, but this is complete speculation. You know, it, it depends on uh, if there's water, what the water is like. Is it fresh or salty? What kind of salt it is? And, 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 and. So the important thing here to know is that um, we're still learning about these things. 
Uh, we have found planets that are at the right distance from their star and at the right size to be kind of like the Earth, and we're getting, we're getting better. We're finding these planets in the right spot and the right size. The more we look for these things, the more we're going to find, the closer we get to seeing one that looks like Earth. Scientists working on NASA's Kepler mission announced they have discovered more than 1,100 planetary candidates in the Space Telescope's field of view. The findings are based on the results of observations of more than 156,000 stars conducted between May and September of 2009. Now these are candidates. But most of them, I'm convinced, will be confirmed in the, in the coming months and years. That's more than all the people have found so far in history. Among the 1,100 planet candidates, the Kepler science team has found 54 that are orbiting in their star's habitable zone, a region where liquid water could exist on the surface of a planet. Five of those candidates are near Earth size, and the other 49 range in size from twice the size of the Earth to larger than Jupiter. Ground-based observatories and NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope will be used this spring and summer to help determine if these candidates can be validated as planets. Not only is the Kepler team finding individual planetary candidates, they are also discovering some of their first multi-planet systems as well. They have detected 86 potential planetary systems that may have two or more planets. One system, named Kepler-11, has been confirmed to have at least six planets orbiting a sun-like star. The Kepler-11 planetary system is amazing. It's amazingly compact. It's amazingly flat. There's an amazingly large number of big planets orbiting close to their star. We didn't know such systems could even exist. They're certainly far fewer than 1% of stars have systems like Kepler-11. But whether it's one in a thousand, one in ten thousand, or one in a million, that we don't know, because we only know one of them. Scientists are excited that the number of planetary candidates discovered in four months' worth of data shows promise that a relatively large number of planets may exist in our galaxy. We're learning so much more about the orbits of planets, the masses of planets, the sizes of planets, and we're just beginning. Kepler is still returning data, and we're going to learn a fantastic amount about the diversity of planets out there around stars within our galaxy. We have found 500 planets in orbit around other stars. Most of these exoplanets are very large gas giants, many much larger than Jupiter, and are detected by measuring small dips in brightness as the planet moves across the disk of the host star. While these measurements can be made from ground-based telescopes, we can make more precise measurements from space. And in 2009, NASA launched the Kepler Space Telescope with the mission of finding smaller planets, planets more like the Earth. The Kepler mission is designed to look at only one region of the sky for its entire lifetime. Its goal? To find terrestrial planets, defined as those one half to twice the size of the Earth, and especially those in the habitable zone of their stars where liquid water and possibly life might exist. Many question why, in our search for life elsewhere in the cosmos, we limit our search to Earth-sized planets within this so-called habitable zone. Surely we can't predict what may be possible in a galaxy with over 100 billion stars. Why would we limit ourselves so severely? For example, one could imagine that life could arise in sulfuric acid oceans with extremely high pressures. Or perhaps in a dry, cold, rocky world or perhaps even in one of the huge gas giants already discovered. So why are we so concerned about this habitable zone and finding planets the size of the Earth? While it is entirely reasonable to contemplate all possibilities, searching for all of them isn't practical. When embarking on a search of such magnitude, it makes sense to start our journey with what we know is possible. We know that life can emerge and thrive in an environment 
and under conditions similar to ours. We know this because we are here. The earth is teeming with life. Since the search for life elsewhere in our galaxy is so daunting, so magnificent in scope, what limited resources we do manage to bring to bear on this search should be carefully designed and executed to ensure maximum return for our efforts. We are seeking an answer to one of the most important and profound questions humanity has ever asked. Are we alone? Kepler is designed specifically to help answer this question. It stares at only one area of the sky and will do so for the entire mission. It is recording the light from over 100,000 stars similar to our sun for over four years in the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra, an area rich in stars. On January 10th, 2011, after gathering and analyzing over eight months of data transmitted from the spacecraft, the Kepler science team announced the discovery of the first rocky, Earth-sized world, Kepler-10b. The good news is that this world is roughly the size of the Earth. It is 1.4 times that of our home. The bad news is Kepler-10b does not lie within the coveted habitable zone. The orbit of this planet around its star is 20 times closer than Mercury is to the Sun. It would be extremely unlikely to find life here. The temperatures on this world reach 1800 Kelvin. The surface, pulled and torn by the tidal forces of the star, are fractured and sculpted by molten rock as it orbits the star once every 20 hours. There is almost no chance that life could ever emerge here. The discovery of Kepler-10b is a significant milestone in our search for terrestrial planets and for life elsewhere in the galaxy. This find is a harbinger of the discoveries to come. If Kepler can find such a small world so close to its parent star, then finding these planets around other stars looks promising. The number of terrestrial planets ultimately located by Kepler will be very eye-opening. If it finds many, then the chances that life is common in the cosmos becomes more likely. If it finds very few, then humanity may face a lonely future.